So I'll begin by saying that regenerative design really begins by trying to leverage above sustainability. How do we enhance nature through an improvement of development? Hello, everyone. So I'm here with Sean from HOK Architects, and that was Janine Benyus from Biomimicry 3.8 on the video. And you're fresh out of Project Positive, right, in the deep depths of Montana. Yeah, that's right, Joe. Thanks so much for having me here. And it's a real testament to how we form relationships from the Blackfoot Ranch in Montana all the way through to the Roundhouse Theater here in London. That Project Positive through Biomimicry 3.8 and Ellen MacArthur Foundation are creating a phenomenal network and connection. Nice. Okay, so our job is to bring uh, regenerative design in the built environment to life for our audience. And uh, we're going to do it by kind of crab walking around this circular stage yeah. a little bit. So can you tell us who is doing this and how? And, and just run us through some examples. Yeah, sure thing. So I'll begin by saying that regenerative design really begins by trying to leverage above sustainability. How do we enhance nature through an improvement of development? And so we'll begin in the Washington, D.C. with the St. Elizabeth Coast Guard headquarters, where the Anacostia River meets the Potomac. It's here, Janine mentioned a key challenge. How do we ensure that the watershed from our buildings going into the water can actually purify it? Beavers do this. They funnel water, they filter it, and then they store it. So how could our new U.S. Coast Guard headquarters project for the Department of Defense work as well as the forest just adjacent to it, and that the watershed coming down from the impervious development around us might actually lead to not only cleaner water, but enable eagles to now nest, deers migrate across our site, and the people that work inside of this building have a phenomenal view cascading down this terraces. Biophilic design tells us we can enhance our connection to nature through this, but what's interesting here is when we engineer that, the soils here, drawing from the ecotones that we find in the uh, uh, Piedmont Mountains, actually will funnel through and filter that stormwater. As it moves to those different layers, it comes down to a final stormwater retention system, an artificial wetland that enables us to re-irrigate our site, funnel water into the building, but also feed out to that Anacostia River, slowly purifying it. From water abundance and resiliency risk to scarcity, I'll take you to Dubai, where the Alberari family has led the largest nursery in the Middle East 10 minutes south uh, of Dubai. And it's really by looking at the habitat inspiration of al Ain Oasis that we began to understand a little bit more about how groundwater sustains itself within an oasis. The landscape species funnel it back down into the ground. So as they began to develop a hospitality and residential development, how can we take the water feeding into the buildings and re-inject it down into the ground and funnel it through verdant waterways that reinforce the landscape, but also create an environment, an air quality, that's actually five degrees Celsius cooler than the 40 degrees Celsius env environment around Dubai. And at the surface level, where temperatures are up to 50 degrees Celsius, our soil is consistently static at around 30. It's at this point that we can start creating architecture that funnels those breezes and allows not only nature to thrive, but people and communities in a pedestrian-only environment without the introduction of cars and enable a verdant environment that can restore itself long term. Great. Well, I'm not sure who's catching who here. Let's <laughs> race around the circle. I'm going to start so, funneling you boxing style. <laughs> so two um, examples, very different ge geographies and, and locations, but, but I guess water management, the central theme there with cascading benefits. Can you give us some other case examples where perhaps the design choice, you know, the starting point is, is different? And I think in these, we're also going to see some of the interplay between the different circular economy principles, right, where you Absolutely. can actually design out uh, components of buildings or even whole bits of buildings themselves and create positive impacts on nature. Yeah, so these first two projects really looked at how do we create buildings within nature. The next question is how do we build nature into buildings, into the urban scape, and do that in a way that not only reinforces water, but enhances air quality, allows carbon sequestration, and reinforces health and well-being. And so in Singapore, for the uh, De Department of Health, we looked at the dipterocarp forest. And those layers of the rainforest begin with water quality and soil erosion control, but it moves up to that air quality, filtration. What if we applied that to the medical system? And that if a public dorm room bed, which is so normally splayed out just in parallel, began to open up, enable patients with access to daylight and views, but if we splayed that out much like a branching system within a tree does, and we enabled that ventilation flows to be induced through the formation of the building itself, 
that we could create not only those other qualitative benefits for patients, but actually enable natural ventilation without the risk of cross-contamination. And so here at the multiple levels of this hospital, we allow the community publicly, whether you're a patient or not, to walk across us, avoiding the roadside emissions, and allow a better environment for patients to heal and for doctors and physicians to recover from their stressful environments. It's here where we start seeing how nature it actually is enhancing the buildings, but also how the buildings and their water flows begin to re-enhance nature. We'll move next to Stanford uh, in, in, in Palo Alto, California, and how a new Center for Academic Medicine is creating a science and technology research center that is meant to join disparate groups of physicians and surgeons with, with clinicians, with researchers and, and office administrators. And it's at our arboretum that we looked at the coastal live oak, an ecosystem engineer. Coastal oaks filter through daylight and create a, dis, uh, a, a unique dithering quality of light. A sequester carbon and they exude out oxygen. That evapotranspiration environment actually creates a coolness environment. We don't want to blur the boundaries between the indoors and outdoors. We want to break them open completely. And so it's in this environment that we really begin to invite that coastal oak to actually migrate into the courtyards of our building. As many projects do, they want to be bigger than code will allow them to be. And so we've programmed 20% of the office environment outdoors through climatic tuning in the summertime of shade and wind, through wintertime by exposure to sun and shade from that breeze. We've enabled this environment to be consistently comfortable. And so the lowest carbon building is the building that we don't build at all. We've removed it from the process. And we've allowed that nature now to migrate out into the arboretum through our landscaping systems and brought it back in. It's the work of Project Positive, led by Biomimicry 3.8, that leads that intelligence, Ecometric Solution Group to allow us to do ecosystem service modeling, HOK, that creative design flow, and Jacobs to engineer and bring it to scale. But we need more change agents. We need other client groups like Google and Kohler that we work with to join us. And so in partnership with EMF, I know Project Biomimicry 3.8 really welcomes many of the aspiring ideas and ideas that you all may have. Great, a great plug there for uh, the Project Positive project. So the foundation has just signed a partnership with Biomimicry 3.8, and that will give access for network organizations to the Biomimicry 3.8 team and to Project Positive. So you'll hear more on all of those opportunities from us.